Okay, good afternoon. I don't think I need to, to add anything to the introduction made by, uh, by Anish. Huh? Just one thing, I also have a life outside of work. So I'm um, originally from France. Huh? Um, I'm married, I have four children, plus a dog because I've worked for the pet food division of Nestle, so I, had to, <laughs> huh? I have to support my former colleagues. Huh? Uh, what I want to show you, uh, and I think uh, and we have more or less 30 minutes, so I need to make it quite short to keep a bit, uh, bit of time for the question, is more all the journey we have made in Nestle in demand planning process. Uh, not only from a, from a tool perspective, but a bit everything. Where we are today, what are the challenges that we face? Uh, and I've seen some this morning which are really common. Uh, a lot of the things I have seen this morning in the various, various presentations are, are really uh, things we face today. And what are, what are a bit the next steps? I don't want to make to give you a very academic thing. On you need to do this or this or this. It's just, you know, these are a bit of several factors that you need to have in mind. Just a bit of history of Nestle. You all know probably the chocolate, whatever. In fact, this company started with one guy who was a German pharmacist, and who did experiment some milk powder for babies that were dying of the way when their mother could not breastfeed. So you see it started all as an experimentation, but as you can see today, after 150 years, the experimentation really became big. And that's what I want also to show you with what we've done in demand planning. If you look in 150 years, and that's a very important factor for the complexity of the demand planning, so you see since 1866, many acquisitions. Some categories which are very specific, you see the water there, very seasonal. Huh? In the water business, you sell probably 75 to 80 percent of your yearly sales within uh, May to September, huh? and even sometimes May to August. So very, very high complexity in terms of demand planning. Also, you see here some, I would say, the border with pharma. Huh? Galderma is a, a company that produces uh, dermatologic creams, whatever, huh? that used to be a joint venture with L'Oreal, which Nestle took over back in 2014. Huh? So you see, I mean, Novartis is more or less the same, uh, and lately a few investments that were made in coffee. So you see, there is a really big diversity in the portfolio we have to manage. Yeah. Second point, uh, in terms of the influential in the demand planning, is that the, the size of it. Yeah. This is just 2016 uh, figures. Yeah. You see that, in fact, with close to its 90 billion, uh, you can keep in mind, 90 billion uh, USD as, a, as net net sales, that's making us the biggest company in the, in the food industry. Uh, so that's really a big challenge also, because you know a slight error in what you plan may have some big consequences at the end. Uh, so that's really something very difficult. We have about 450 factories across the world. Uh, so that's also giving you the size. But I'm in charge of demand and supply planning, so the demand is just in one part. I also need to make sure that the, all what we do in demand planning is passed onto the production uh, engines. And one thing, I'm, te I'm telling you about the, the, the complexity and to pass in demand planning. If we connect this to the raw material that we buy, you see the weight we have when we buy coffee or when we buy chocolate may have a big impact not only on the farmers, but also on the, I would say, overall trading of these commodities. <coughs> if we are too, too optimistic by 10% in coffee, you see it's 1% of the world production that can be at stake. And that's really something we need to really take care. Huh? The impact down can be, can be really huge. Third point uh, about the complexity is about the, the, the geography. Huh? We are everywhere. Huh? You have more or less the figures, which is, uh, and these are the net net sales uh, for each of the three zones uh, which are managing. So you see, obviously, that uh, America is the biggest one. Uh, mostly because of the US. Uh, US out is, of these 40 billion is probably nearly half of it. Uh, so that's really huge. Uh, the rest is Europe and North of Africa and Asia here. And we have here, I told you we have 450 factories, but a lot of cross-border supply. So which means from the moment you make your demand until the moment you have product in stock, there can be some quite long lead times. So if your demand is variating too much, you may end up in, in big messes uh, and be obliged to use air freight to transport things which you should never do uh, because air freight is very expensive. Uh. So uh, if, you, if I summarize, I mean, the, the, the big challenge uh, within the demand, first the geography. Uh, we even have a small operation in North Korea, by the way, uh, just for people who misbehave a little. Just <laughs> 
Uh, so geography, the size, and the various categories. Uh, and that's really the three main things which are making it very difficult. Uh. If we look now a bit more uh, uh, in detail how we do demand planning today, the, the journey we've made, uh, we, like many of you, started you know, with uh, very basic data. Uh, when I started in the pet food division back in 95, 6, uh, to do your demand planning, the only data you had were the sale of Nestlé to all your clients. Huh? And I remember when I wanted sales even by client to get the Tesco in the UK or the Carrefour in France, I had to go to the IT department and ask for that, that, that huh? you know, very difficult. So really basic. Huh? Today, I would say huh, we, we are somewhere around there. Huh? And that's a bit what I'm going to show you. Huh? The external data have come around. But the main point huh, is that we need to be close to what's happening there. Uh, this is where, I mean, I saw this morning uh, from Eric Wilson a presentation, a photo of Charlie Chase, uh, with somebody from SAS that I've met uh, quite often. Charlie is, is calling this a true demand. Is what's happening in the shops. Uh, and now you have physical shops, but you also have online, which is making it even a bit more difficult, uh, because we have different channels to capture the, the information that we need. Uh. And the ultimate goal is to really get something that's much more perspective. Uh where we don't need so many human intervention, and we could get some analytics that's really telling us what's, what we need to do. Huh? But we're not yet there, even if uh, we're moving. So if we look uh, uh, with the geographies, what we've done, in fact, all our demand planning process now is covered with some predictive analytics. Uh, you see, OK, we still have a few, uh, a few countries. Uh, North Korea is not in yet. Uh, nobody wants to go there for, uh, from SAS. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't need because it's a bit like Venezuela. Everything is just uh, flat. <laughs> now, you see, we have a few, a few countries uh, still in Africa. Uh, South Africa should be now, in fact, uh, dark blue like all the others, as well as uh, Maghreb is now starting. It's more here we're a bit late because we are not organized on a, let's say, decentralized way, country by country, but we have big regions. So when you take this, you know, so-called, this one is called Equatorial African Region. You have 23 countries. So it's a bit more difficult than when you have, you know, just South Africa here. Uh, so you see, we have, I mean, 46 markets. We have about 300 users, uh, which are, you know, quite, I would say, familiar now with analytics. Uh, and here, it's an internal KPI that we have, which is, we call it the adoption rate. How many SKUs in our portfolio are we using directly the statistical forecast? Uh, and we are about 50%. So it means that we've reached, uh, we have saved by this. It's very difficult uh, to, 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 I would say, figure out the, the, the amount of money. That's what my boss is always asking me, but you know, it's just a bit difficult. But we saved a lot of efficiency in the demand planning teams because we can say that we have nearly 50% of our SKUs for which we just take directly a statistical forecast. Uh, now the challenge is the remaining 50%. One example, uh, because we, we, we need to sell much better this uh, analytics impact. Uh, and you, we, we can really show, and that's a very recent one, uh, Dolce Gusto, probably all of you know, because it's existing nearly everywhere in Europe, uh, but it was launched recently in Brazil, uh, I think uh, 18 months ago. So they started directly, uh, after a while, sorry, they started with, with analytics. What you see is that, okay, the adoption, okay, they, they are a bit above. Uh, between 2016 and 2017. So the demand plan accuracy one month ahead jumped above 80%, uh, which was really a big step compared to what they were doing at the beginning. Then this one is uh, the case level, the, case, the service level, in fact, what you give to clients. Uh, so here, you know, 98 to 99 is very important. doesn't look very big, but I can tell you with some clients, uh, like the, the Carrefour from France, which is quite strong in Brazil, when you get 0.01%, it's good. Uh, so that's really something what, uh, which, which was a big achievement. Freshness is our, it's also an internal KPI, is the remaining shelf life of the product when it's delivered to the client. Uh, because you know we have, our uh, food is getting, you know, I wouldn't say worse than worse, but we need to sell it before it's reaching close to the best before date. So the longer remaining shelf life you have at the client, the better it is. Uh, this went to 84% of the total. Uh, and at the end of the day, and that's something that's talking a lot and with finance people, we, we, we decrease the stock very quickly. Uh, so you see, and here, and that was one of the challenges, with that sort of example, we can really connect 
what we do in analytics with some business benefits that can be you know, very tangible. It's money. Huh? You know, stock cover, you can uh, figure out in number of pallets that we didn't need to, to pay storage for, in the working capital that's a mobile. You have a lot of things that you can sell afterwards. Huh? Because this part that we're all talking a lot about analytics, about demand planning improving, I mean, not even at senior level, not everybody is convinced of this. Huh? So that's really important to make uh, this connection with, with business. So that's a bit where we are, <clears throat> and there were, I would say, three, uh, the three big things, and I'm, I'm, it's quite similar to what Eric Wilson presented this morning. Uh, the, the three pillars to which, thanks to which we could do it, the first one was the organization. Uh, when we started this, this journey in analytics, I mean, the SNOP for us was already something very strongly in the company. Uh, Nestle, I mean, we didn't call it SNOP because we made something different, uh, but at the end, it's exactly this. We called it monthly business planning. Uh, and there was a dedicated team that started, I think, 2009, 2010, to really make an implementation fully all over Nestle. Uh, very simple, you know, we had a guideline, you know, you have four meetings in a month, one each week. For each of them, there is, a, in this guideline, you have the agenda, what are the input information, the output information, and who should attend. Very simple. With time, we made it a bit more complex. Uh, I would say today it's a bit of a challenge because we made it very simple at the beginning, which worked very well. The fact is that you, you face so many different situations and, and I would say a growing complexity that it's a bit difficult today. Uh, and uh, we need to, that's one of the challenges uh, I have with my, uh, my colleagues because yeah, one, one important point is that it was truly cross-functional, uh, this SNOP project, with finance, commercial, and the supply chain operations. Huh? Not one function, but really the three. And it was even led by finance at that time. Huh? So that was really giving a big weight to it. Huh? And all this was really supported by senior management. Huh? I, I know there is this afternoon somebody presenting the, the, and getting the CEO blessing. That was really something that went top down. Huh? And that's why it went so quickly. Huh? Because between 2009, 2010 until 20, I would say 13, I would say probably 90% uh, of, uh, of the sales of Nestle were covered with this SNOP. Yeah. Second thing were the people. Uh, I think uh, when we started the analytics journey, uh, I mean, the, go the goal at that time, that was back in 2013, uh, when I arrived in that position, was to have some very small teams of specialists, you know, not really decentral, a bit, you know, uh, in some centers of competence. But to start with, that would not have worked. Uh, because, you know, you need, when you have a good SNOP as a base, you need some people in every location to speak to others, to especially commercial people, and explain them why from statistics we get these figures. If you can't do this, you know, I think maybe many people here know, uh, when you are in a, in a forecast meeting with some salespeople who have 20 years experience, they will just laugh at you when you say that your machine can do better than what they do. I have 20 years experience, you know, that's bullshit. Okay. <laughs> no, no. So... And the SNOP is something very local. Huh? So what we started to do is to have everywhere, every country, and that's what you've seen before, some people were demand analysts. So it was, uh, and I think the, the, the talent challenge is a, is a big one at the moment. We had to recruit some people everywhere. And I can tell you, it's still a challenge. Huh? We, we sometimes are losing some, we are, but at least we have a network now nearly everywhere of people who are capable to really maintain this connection with, uh, with the other, I would say, parties of uh, SNOP. And the last one was a tool. I think many people, when they talk about analytics, they, they talk first about the tool. I think I put it at the end, because if we would not have had those two first, this would have never worked. You can put the best tool. If you don't have a proper organization and the right people below, it's just you can forget about it. Mm -hmm. So in our case, that was SAS. If you have questions on SAS, you can see you have two persons there. They even have some books from Charlie Chase that they can provide you. So. And uh, yeah, I think that the, the last book of Charlie Chase is something I can recommend because we, we've even a bit exchanged some ideas when he wrote it. Uh, and that's really something that you, that's very uh, useful. Uh. So what, what we are facing today? Uh, I mean, now, as I told you, we have covered, I would say, more geographies with the basic use of statistics. Uh, uh, well integrated into our SNOP, so working well. Uh. Now we have a few countries, given the specific situation, who are going on with some very advanced use of statistics. Huh? Because they have the right people for this, 
Uh, and also because they have local, I would say, constraints. Uh, so these are just some examples in Australia, in India, Pakistan. Uh, China is also a lot. I will give you a, a few examples. Poland uh, is one of the countries in Europe where we, we, we make a lot of progress. Brazil, US, Canada. I mean, these are really something where we, yeah, so we need to do something. Uh, it can be, for example, whatever. You have some market, I will show you afterwards, uh, where you have more and more promotions coming on. So what do we do? New product forecasting, all these things. So we need to do something. Uh, and if we look at uh, the, 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 I would say, two impactors, uh, on these, uh, on the, which are the reason why we need to change, in fact, to, to, to readapt a bit our approach to demand planning, especially the analytics part. One is external, which is uh, the business evolution. Uh, in the food industry, I would say in a lot of FMCG, we now live in a very soft growth environment. Uh, everybody is fighting like hell to get a bit of growth. I remember when I was 10 years ago in Nestle, uh, it was not double digit, but the global of Nestle was about 5-6% growth every year, and that was just cruising. Uh, this year, at the end of uh, September, as the sales were published, the growth accumulated for the first nine months is only 2.6. Uh, so that's really something where, where you need to fight. So, and same thing for retailers. Huh? Retailers fight between themselves, and they also fight with the e-commerce that's going bigger and bigger. Huh? And the big challenge, what I put there, is with e-commerce, and I will give you some figures afterwards, is that the size of the data you, want to, you, you, you get uh, is something that uh, if you still use Excel or Access, you just forget. Uh? Uh, I will show you uh, uh, from China. So you see where we are, uh, and if we take the example speci specifically of promotions, uh, so that's not for, from us, uh, it's a Nielsen report that was published two years ago, but I think the figures are still, are still okay. Uh, in the FMTG, you have only one third of promotions which are making money. Two thirds are just useless. Uh, and you have even some, uh, about 20, let's say one fourth, uh, which are depleted. Uh, how do you say, depleting uh, to, your, to your sales and your profitability. <laughs> so you see, and in Nestle, like in others, and we all have in our, I would say, commercial guideline that for each promo, we should do a post-evaluation, blah, 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 da, da, da. It's written everywhere, but nobody does it correctly. Uh. And just to show you, and again, this is, these are really approximative figures. Uh. We, we tried to make, uh, for the promotion, uh, an estimation of the size, the part of the portfolio, and it's not only Nestle, huh? it's a bit, uh, it's a wider the food industry, which is sold on promotion. Huh? And uh, you can see that in some places, I mean, you have more than half of your portfolio sold on the promotion. So if you don't master these promotions, if you are not capable to make a real, you know, study on which are the ones that are working well, which are profitable, which are bringing the benefits, you just lost. Huh? And you know, there is a big, lot of money at stake. You know, when you do promos with uh, Walmart, with whoever, Coles in Australia, or Carrefour, or now with X5 in Russia, or, or JD.com in, in China, you need to pay a lot of money. So investing the money wisely is really what we can bring there. Yeah. And then if you look at uh, the specific of e-commerce, uh, I mean, that's where we are, more or less, uh, from last year. 5% of the sales of Nestle are made via e-commerce. Uh, we have various channels. Some of them we are mastering totally. Some are with you know, pure players, or we have like Alibaba here. Uh, and this is growing every year. It's going to be, I don't know, probably for 2017, around the 7% and, and growing very fast. When I told you about JD.com, so JD.com is, a, I don't know if uh, a lot of you uh, know, have heard about it. Uh, it's purely Chinese. Uh, I'm very lucky in my job because I travel quite a lot. Uh, uh, if you count that in China you have 1.3 billion people, only if 1% are buying product via JD.com, JD.com can provide us with all the data regarding the Nestle product, nearly sales by day and whatever. So you can imagine that, you know, from 1.3, you take uh, 1 uh, 1.3 1 million uh, people data, it's just massive, it's enormous. Uh, the quantity of uh, information that you need to analyze afterwards is just huge. Uh, so you need to have different ways than what we used to do in the past. Uh, and that's going to grow. Uh, I think we, we also have a few, I would say, quite uh, close collaboration with Ocado, which is a pure UK one. Uh, same thing, Ocado is really I mean, willing to collaborate. 
Yeah? But that's the same, same challenge. Okay, the size of UK is different than China, yeah? but still, yeah? we have exactly the same challenge. Few examples, where well, this one, I mean, yeah, the graphs are, are, are not so, uh, doesn't tell a lot. You've seen that China uh, is really the place uh, where we, we have the, the highest uh, proportion of promos. Uh, and also in, in India, so yeah, I said China, it's India there. Huh? You have the flag there. Uh, in India, this is probably the market where the trade is totally unconsolidated. Uh, the biggest of our client in India is probably no more than 1%. Uh, and we use about 1,600 distributors all over the country. So when you have 60% of promo, you need to be sure that promo that you make with this product at that place is the right one to be beneficial. Uh, we are very lucky in India. Uh, I think I was talking with some people this morning about collecting data from uh, especially distributors. In fact, Nestle India worked already for several years about getting from their distributors the quantity, I mean, the stocks and the sell out from the distributors. So this, we have a long enough history. Yeah. And then, this is made with SaaS afterwards, we can really make a sellout forecast directly per each distributor. And you can imagine that with 1,600 distributors, it's quite a challenge. Yeah. So that's really a big thing. Yeah. Another example very close, yeah, is in, uh, which is uh, uh, after promotion about new product launch, or probably is, uh, you, you have here a comparison, uh, that's from Poland, uh, which is where I was supply chain head uh, for the Baltics, Poland Baltics region some years ago. In green, uh, you have the demand plan accuracy of new products made by SaaS, and the red one is the one made, I would say, with a traditional discussion with people around the table without really fact-based. Uh, so you see there is no, no discussion. Uh, and I can tell you that new product introduction, uh, several people this morning were talking about slow-moving, slow obsolete products. Uh, we call it bad goods in Nestle, which, which are goods that we destroy, uh, which, you know, in the current world is not really ethic. Uh, so we want to have less and less. The number one reason behind the bad goods are new product launch. Because we are always willing to be too, far too optimistic. So we just push a lot in the trade, everything. You know, salespeople, they're always, you know, well, well, let's go, da, da, da. And then at the end, you end up with too much product in the trade. Sometimes the sales are not going as per the plans. And then you, you, you need to collect back afterward and destroy. So you see here, we also get a big, big, big benefit out of it. Huh? Just as, as we have the DPA, do you have an idea of what is the, the demand plan accuracy for Nestlé one month ahead? What it can be? I didn't put it in the presentation, it's just a question. Is it in the 50, 60, 80, 90? 80? 70, yeah. Yeah, the, the one month ahead is 80%. Uh, and the three months ahead is 75, which I think is, is quite good at the moment. Uh, we, we are doing quite well. The big battle we have now is on the bias, uh, because we still have too much variations. Uh, and generally, and I don't think it's a, a specific case of Nestlé, generally we are too optimistic in our forecast. Uh, and that's a, a big thing that we, we, we try to solve with analytics, but it's very difficult. Uh, and when you are too optimistic, you produce too much stock, you pay storage, you have multiple consequences down to bad goods uh, that you need to destroy. No, it's consolidation of all the SKUs. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the message I passed to my boss, huh, who is a corporate supply chain head, uh, for, is that 80 and 75 to me is where we need to be. Huh? Going above would be really a big investment. But we need, what we want to fight is really the bias. Huh? We really want to drive down this, you know, too optimistic. And it's a big issue everywhere because you use too much of your factories, uh, you store too much product, you have... Yeah, a lot of, I would say, bad consequences afterwards. Yeah. So, after those two examples, so what we, uh, where we are at the moment, uh, you see we, we more or less, uh, we have made a three-stage approach to demand planning and the use of analytics. Uh, so this one uh, is what I told you, generating baseline, things like, this is working already nearly everywhere. Uh, I think the, we are probably a bit too modest with this because we, are, we, we really have a good coverage there. Uh, here, uh, this is where we have the big question mark at the moment. What should we do? How should we organize the next level? Do we need to change in, a, in our SNOP process? Do we need to bring more analytics? How do we need to reorganize? Uh, ultimately, uh, I see yes, many people uh, are talking about IBP, about uh, integrated business planning. That's where we should go. But then uh, I think it's 
that's a journey there. Uh, it's just a summary of, uh, we need to have uh, more business benefit. I think the unpredictability is something that's, that's growing. I told you about more promotion. People are changing. Uh, we have multi-channel uh, now sales, so it's very difficult. Uh, people skills, very difficult. Uh, uh, new data sources. I mean, these are I mean, just a summary of what I told you before. So the second thing, uh, the second challenge we have is internal. Uh, here what you have, at the, the, it's a report that was uh, about CPG published by Accenture. You can find it, uh, it's maybe a bit, not old, but yeah, it's from 2014 or 15, I think. Uh, but I, I, I found it quite, well, quite good when I uh, took that job. And you see there is a word about CPG firms moving slowly to analytics. Uh, so you know, pff, that's something where we need to invest a bit more. Uh, and that doesn't sound very positive. And in fact, in that report, they, they figure out all the possible organizations. So you've seen what, from what I told you before, that we, we have started there. Uh, in Nestlé, we, we have been very decentralized, because what we think is that anyway, the SNOP process is happening everywhere. It's not centralized. It's happening where you can have people from commercial teams, from finance and supply chain meeting together. So that's where we went, uh, which was very, I would say, efficient from the beginning, because we had some I would say, analytically skilled people everywhere to explain what the forecast was, how we could get to this result via statistics. Today, it's no longer possible to go on like this, because when you move to this you know, causal analysis on promotions, on new product forecast, long-term planning, and because we also need to support, for example, CapEx investment, where do we need to build new factories, by when do we need to build a new factory, everything. So you need forecast by five or 10 years for this. Uh, sometimes it's quite long. Here, we cannot work with such a network. We, do, we, we need people who have a bit more skills. So in fact, the thing we, we're going to do, uh, it's, it's really something that we are moving slowly. Uh, we are doing some, I would say, experimentations. Uh. The first one, experimentation was there. Now it's totally industrialized. So here, we're going to build, uh, we think, some, some small centers of excellence where, what I would say, some uh, more I would say, skill people in, in statistics. Uh, because that's really where we can afterwards have a, have a much bigger impact everywhere. Uh. Strong SNOP is a foundation. Uh, I think uh, Eric Wilson, so, uh, you had exactly that phrase, that if you do not have it as a base, anyway, just forget. This is where you make one single plan for the company. You make people from commercial teams, from finance and operations have one plan. There might be some slight differences in between. Uh. For me, the, the biggest Difficulties there, which we still see, is that people are talking in different units. You know, people from operations, they talk in case or in pallet, whatever, whereas salespeople are talking with their, you know, dollar target or euro target, and finance are talking about profitability. So, you know, the day we will have something that will be able to convert all these together in a real time during the meeting, that's really where we get something, you know, that's very efficient to support SNOP. Yeah. Second thing, uh, you need to be able to bring the analytics into the SNOP. Uh, you've seen, I mean, uh, the adoption rate, we have 50% of the SKUs. I can give you, in Nestlé today, we have 60,000 SKUs globally, uh, which are live at one moment. Uh, so 60,000, even if you have a lot of people doing this, you can't manage this you know, manually as we used to do. So you need to have people everywhere to bring some analytics background and to bring some more fact-based discussion. Uh, very often, when you have commercial people, discussions are more emotional than really fact-based. Uh, and that's really a big issue there afterwards. Uh. You know, uh, I think what we see, and that's what I just finished with, uh, is that we, we need really to have more and more skilled people. Uh, and that's going to be a challenge for the coming years, uh, because I think everybody will fight for this. Uh, and that's why having some centers of competence is really the way uh, we can solve that, uh, that challenge for the future. Okay, so. That's it. Thank you.